morning, everyone. It's great to see you here. And I'm Sophia. I've been Pink Week's Education and Awareness Officer for this year, 2019. Um, just a few things to mention before we get started on the panel. Um, you may have seen on your way in that there is a collection bucket that will be there on the way out if you have any spare pounds or pennies to drop in. Um, we are also selling a few bits and pieces, a few earrings, um, things like that. So if you'd like to buy them, they are also on your way out. Um, and we have leaflets from one of our charities, Copperfield. Again, they will be available for you to grab on your way out. So thank you for coming to the panel. Um, the aim of this event is obviously Pink Week does a lot of fundraising, but we are also um, incredibly keen on raising awareness and educating ourselves about breast cancer. Um, so we've deliberately picked slightly controversial issues to discuss tonight for which there is no clear answer. Um, but we hope that by coming and thinking about the issues, you can leave a little bit more informed, maybe having substantiated your view or changed it a little bit. Okay, so I am now introduced myself. I would like to introduce my lovely panelists who've come all this way to um, speak to us. So first of all, we have Ros Given Wilson. We have Heidi Lochlin. We have Sean Wilkinson and Liz O'Riordan. And if we could just start, could each of you give a little bit, two minute summary of who you are and what you do? If we start with you, Liz. So um, I'm a consultant breast surgeon at Ipswich Hospital, and I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer myself in July 2015. Following that, I started blogging, talking, and actually writing a book called The Complete Guide to Breast Cancer to share my own experiences as being a doctor and a patient. My cancer came back locally in May this year, and I finished treatment a couple of months ago, and I'm still a strong patient advocate for helping people get their lives back and the importance of exercise after cancer. Great. You? Um, hi, so I'm, I'm Sean. Um, I head up the Challenge Events and Student Engagement Team at Breast Cancer Now. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, Breast Cancer Now is um, the UK's biggest breast cancer research charity. So we're currently funding £24 million worth of breast cancer research. Um, we work with 450 researchers um, across the UK. Um, and our aim is that by 2050, everybody who develops breast cancer will live and live well. Thank you. And Heidi? just need to check this is on first because I've just been switching all the buttons on and off absent-mindedly. Um, hi, I'm Heidi. Um, I have stage four inflammatory breast cancer. I was diagnosed when I was pregnant in 2015 and chose to decline treatment to give birth to my daughter who then unfortunately died from an infection in hospital. Um, I write a blog called Storm in a Tick Cup which is um, a worldwide blog now um, and currently just finished writing a book and I like to do lots of talks to raise awareness about inflammatory breast cancer and baby loss. Great. Find you, Ros. Right. I'm Ros Given-Wilson. I'm a breast radiologist, so I've spent the last 30 years working in breast diagnostics um, and I'm particularly interested in breast screening, which seems to be one of the most controversial of all the screening programs. Um, so I think we're probably going to have a bit of discussion about that tonight. That's very much the aim. Um, so just before we get on to that, actually, um, just to say that the format is we will be discussing um, a few set issues uh, to start with for about an hour, and then in the lat latter part, we will be taking questions from the audience. So if you do think of something, um, please keep it into the end, and then we will do our best to try and answer your questions. So starting on breast cancer screening, um, Basically, breast cancer screening is a type of screening program that uses an X-ray called a mammogram to try and detect um, early stage breast cancers or lumps before they are palpable or visible, um, as you may have seen a lot of the check yourself leaflets that are available from charities. So before those stages, the idea being that if you can catch um, a potential breast cancer early, you can then intervene early, start treatment, and ultimately improve the outcomes for your patients. Um, so that's the general idea. Obviously, Ros, this is your speciality. Is there anything you'd like to add on that? I'd probably just add a little bit about the age that screening is applicable. So for the general population, screening is, is generally in this country kept between the 50-year-olds and the 70-year-olds, and we do it every three years. We do do some younger women, but those are women who are at particularly high risk, for instance, because of a very strong family history. So... I think it's important to be aware of the, of the age group where screening is applicable. I might just say a few, just a little bit Absolutely. about numbers. Um, 
and I think we're going to come, I just want to talk about numbers for benefit, and I think we're going to come on to mm -hmm. harms in a minute, but just in terms of benefit. So if we take a 1,000 women between 50 and 70 and we screen them, then about 40 of them will be called back for further tests, and about 10 of them, just under 10 of them, will be found to have cancer. And we talk a lot about preventing deaths from cancer, but actually among those 10, probably one in 10, will actually have a death prevented from cancer. So it's quite a small number who end up having things changed, benefiting, starting with a large number of women. And I suspect numbers and the balance of numbers is, is one of the most interesting things about breast screening. And I know you want to come on yeah. to some of the other aspects yes, of absolutely. it. absolutely. Well, I think it is mm. a question of numbers and the interpretation of numbers mm -hmm. from oh, what yes. I've read. Um, yes. So the idea is, so why we're bringing up this topic as a controversial topic is because there has been some, there have been some people who've put forward the idea that um, breast cancer screening has quite a high rate of overdiagnosis, so a high mm. false positive rate. Mm. Um, the Marmo review in 2013 quantified this as 19% false positive rate, um, but actually some advocate, so Michael Baum, for example, who's a scientist in London, advocates that actually if you use more stringent criteria, the rate goes up um, considerably. And so this question of false positive rates mm. is, to my understanding, the main reason why it's controversial. Mm. Um, so I'd like to open up to the panel as to our thoughts on this issue. And I mean, how can we proceed in future? I guess the main question is, what is the role of screening in the future as part of our diagnostic toolkit? Mm. So anyone who'd like to start, please do feel free. Could I just come back, Sophia, on mm, some of the of numbers course. around harm? Because you're quite right that it's tremendously difficult to pin down the numbers. So I've just said a little bit about what the kind of beneficial numbers are. Perhaps we could, could just Absolutely. kind of focus on the, on the definitions and the numbers around potential harm. So I've said if we start with 1,000 women, we recall 40. Well, those 40 are likely to have a quite scary experience when they're called back, and a lot of them will have invasive tests. So we've said that we'll find 10 cancers now, this is where numbers get quite difficult, and I'm going to base my numbers on the Marmot Review, yep, which was the absolutely. last time that people did an independent review. So from that, it was thought that probably three out of those 10 women would be overdiagnosed. And I think it's important to be really clear about what overdiagnosis means. So it means somebody has a diagnosis of cancer that they, if they hadn't been for screening, they would never have had a diagnosis of cancer in their lifetime. So. Either the cancer is so slow growing, so small, so indolent, or something else would have killed them before the cancer did or before it was even diagnosed. So this is, I, th I think if, if you look at those numbers, you can understand why people get quite anxious because there are potentially there, th if we stick with that number of three, and there's a lot of argument about the number of three, but, but poten some people say more and some less, but potentially three women suffering a cancer diagnosis that they needn't have had for one woman having her life saved. And so, for me, a lot of the whole kind of e important bit about screening is we need to be absolutely clear that, we, that women understand when they go into the screening program that there are a number of these harms, that they may be called back for invasive tests which turn out to show nothing, that they may, in the end, have overdiagnosis, so they can actually weigh that against the, the chance that a life is saved. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where people get so upset about it because a lot of people never understand that. And a lot of women go into screening without really understanding that there is this mm -hmm. harms versus So it's this question, this, this question of actually how do we make that information very clear to people before Absolutely. they go in for their screen. I mean, Heidi, Liz, what, I, I'm not sure myself of your interactions with screening, if you'd like to share a bit. Well, in my personal circumstances, a mammogram would have done absolutely nothing for me mm. because I have inflammatory breast cancer, which will not be picked up on a mammogram. To add to that, I was diagnosed at the age of 32, so I wouldn't have fallen into routine um, mammograms anyway. 
Um, my diagnosis was made because I had a very obvious rash um, and I was subsequently turned away from a GP twice and told that I have mastitis when actually I had extremely aggressive breast cancer and still do. Um, it's really difficult with, um, it's interesting what you're saying about the, 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 the overdiagnosis thing. I mean, for me personally, um, it's better than being dead. I would definitely have taken the risk of having a misdiagnosis, which I'm sure the misdiagnosis is then picked up at some point after that. And I can imagine the mental trauma is very difficult for somebody that's given a misdiagnosis. But the trauma have been told that there's nothing wrong with you several times when your cancer is allowed to spread throughout your body. Um, is much more horrifying when early detection is so crucial. I think what you're saying about making it clear is really important. If, you know, we're, we should be allowed to, we're given that information if you're told there's a chance you might have a misdiagnosis, are you still happy to proceed? And I think most women probably would take that, that chance. Um, I certainly would have, so... Um, yeah, I, I kind of fall out of the bracket slightly, I guess, in That's that okay. respect. But um, yeah, I, I certainly would be yeah. taking that risk for a misdiagnosis over a diagnosis that doesn't get picked up. Of course. And anything you'd like to add? So I, I was diagnosed before the age of screening at the age of 40. And some friends of mine said, I'm never going for a mammogram because I don't want to know. I'm in denial. I can't cope with you having it. I can't cope with me. Whereas other women who hadn't been said, right, I need to go and get myself checked out. And I think it's very personal. And the numbers game is really interesting because you can read stats. And both Heidi and I can sit here saying, well, you know, our chances of being alive in next years are this or that. But for you, it's 50-50. The mammogram's normal or it isn't. You have cancer or you don't. You're overdiagnosed or you don't. No one knows whether you're that one or you're the 99. And it's up to you to decide do I want to find out whether it's 50-50 or not? And you can read everything you like, but it's a very personal decision whether you want to know. I think it's a great thing, but I know a lot of scientists and doctors think screening is stupid and we shouldn't do it and it doesn't save lives. And there's always going to be that debate. Well, I think that that's, that's the crux of the issue. I don't think there is one right answer. I think it is about where does this t technology fit in for the future? And I think what you've said is actually really critical. Um, actually being informed when you go in and knowing what you're doing and actually giving back that autonomy to the patient to then decide, yes, I want to, no, I don't want to. And if I do want to, I'm going in well-informed and knowledgeable um, about the risk. Sean, is there anything you'd like to add? I think, um, you know, these ladies here have just really kind of highlighted the importance of, um, especially when you're younger, knowing your breasts as well and, you know, how important it is to kind of know those risk factors and know those signs and... Um, I was saying to Liz earlier, actually, I, I went through a breast cancer scare myself last year. I'm, I'm 28, um, but actually working at Breast Cancer Now really made me know what I was looking for. And, you know, I, I came out of those with the all clear, which was fantastic. But actually, I think if I hadn't been aware of those signs, which is more than just looking for a lump, I maybe wouldn't have gone to my GP um, and wouldn't have taken it further and gone for that further um, test. So I think, you know, you do, um, you said there's some leaflets from Copperfield yeah. at the entrance. So I'd really highlight to everybody, pick one of those up on the way out, like make sure you know your breasts, know your size, know what you're looking for. Um, and yeah, just really educate yourself on that. You're right, because it's not, it's not as simple as just a lump. A lump is one presentation. Yeah. And I'd just like to add, a lot of women believe they've had their mammogram so they can ignore their boobs for the next three years. But cancers can grow and come between mammogram screenings. So you do need to keep checking. Just that three-yearly mammogram isn't enough to be breast aware. And that's a really important message. Mm, absolutely. And coming back to the leaflets, we also have the leaflets in micro format in sort of business card check yourself. So please um, do grab one of those. Um, great. Thank you. So our second topic, and itself is subdivided into three, is attitudes towards pink. So the one I'd like to start with here, um, and it's, I think, particularly relevant for us as Pink Week, a very overtly pink fundraising and awareness initiative, is this question around um, some of the criticism that has been levied at pink fundraising and pink publicity is that it's too cute, it's too kitsch, and potentially it glamorizes breast cancer. What are our views on this? What, what do we think? Do we think that pink is not right for the cause? Um, hmm. It's difficult, isn't it? I, I, I know there are arguments for and against. I kind of go back to thinking about 20 or 30 years ago when the NHS got the concept of markets and competition 
brought in, I think, a chap from Sainsbury's, Griffiths, to say, who said, hospitals should be competing with each other. The market is the way to make the NHS better, and they should each have their own logo and their own brand. And a fortune was spent getting rid of all the blue NHS logos and giving every hospital their own brand and making them compete. And actually, it took a number of years for people to realize patients were confused. They didn't know whether their local hospital was NHS or private. And actually, they just got rid of the best possible brand for healthcare virtually in the world. So I suppose I would say, well, at least people recognize pink. They know what it is. And I think there is something then about how control is kept or how transparent people are about the degree to which they're supporting pink and, for instance, money is being given to charity from things that come with a pink label. So I'm a pragmatist. I would say keep it. You've got a good brand, but use it wisely. And I'm not sure it always is used mm. wise, wisely. I agree. And we'll come on to the co commodification mm. of breast cancer and how it's mm. been misused um, a little bit later. Mm. But Heidi? Yeah, I mean, you basically mm. said what I was going to say, but more Sorry. eloquently. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, people refer to pink washing, um, and particularly in the breast cancer community, and I'm in some very angry breast cancer mm. groups where people say the C word a lot, and they talk about pink washing and how much they hate it, and um, that it's, some people even say it's borderline offensive. But I kind of sit on the fence a little bit in the sense that I think any advertising is good advertising and like you say it's an identifiable brand personally i can't stand pink it makes me want to puke but <laughs> i kind of i get that it is identifiable and and all any awareness raised is good the issue i have um is that there's the sort of the making it trendy and fashionable but not to the benefit of anybody who has cancer because I've seen an awful lot, particularly clothing brands, of people saying, the cancer work. Yes, yeah. those sorts of things. And there's nothing goes towards people with breast cancer. They're just making money out of people that have breast cancer or cancer. And that makes, that makes my blood boil. But I think it's also an issue of not... It's, it's not just exactly where the money's going. I think yeah. that sometimes the, the kind of being aware, like what we talked about, of being aware of your breasts gets lost, mm. and it becomes only about money. And even if that money does go exclusively to breast cancer charity, surely we also want to be getting the information of this is what you're supposed to be looking out for out as well. Yeah. And I think it's very easy to sell a picture of a woman in a sexy pink bra on the cover of an advertising campaign because they'll get people buying it. But when you've lost your breasts, you don't want to buy a pink bra because you can't wear it. And yes, those pink GHD straighteners, when you've lost your hair with chemo, a lot of the pink products are all about femininity and that's stripped from you when you have cancer. So it's what products are being pinked. Yeah. And that's why it upsets a lot of the breast cancer patients because they can't wear or use half the stuff. And again, it's making money rather than raising awareness. It's the same thing as those really irritating social media posts that you get that oh say... Oh, God, Facebook. Yeah, tell us where you put your bag last night because it's raising awareness of breast cancer. It does nothing to raise awareness of no. breast cancer. It just tells people where you leave your bag or you put a heart on your profile. It does nothing to raise awareness yeah. of breast cancer. And in fact, it just really pisses everybody off <laughs> in that community. So it's, it's kind of along those lines, really. Yeah. But yeah, I'm in agreement that it is an identifiable thing. As much as I personally don't like pink, pink stinks, I think that it is, we, what, we all know what it is and therefore yeah. we're willing to put our hands in our pocket and I think that's What do you thing. think? As a charity yes. that is pink? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so um, we um, obviously went through a rebrand. Um, so Breast Cancer Now came from the merger of Breast Cancer Campaign and Breakthrough Breast Cancer. Um, he merged three years ago um, and both of them, uh, their logos and their colours were very, very pink, um, very bright pink. Um, so when we merged and we kind of looked at what does that new charity look like, um, we did spend a lot of time looking at focus groups and um, getting inputs, um, asking people what they thought. And yes, you are right. And, you know, um, pink is very synonymous with um, breast cancer and that is why we decided to go with it. We we did then make the decision um, to go for what we thought was much warmer pink. Um, so it's still it, pink. it is still yeah. pink. It is still pink. Um, and you know, introducing that grey into um, our palette as well. So and we do use um, the pink and the grey on a really equal basis. Um, and we try and make it as inclusive as possible. Um, I know that it's not always going to be to everybody's taste, but you know, we do try um, really hard to use the right logos and the right colours and the right. Um, formats in the right situations and I think we're also really cautious that 
sometimes um, pink can be used in a very happy and positive way mm -hmm. but for women who are living with breast cancer especially secondary breast cancer we're always aware that that might not be how they're feeling and that's not mm -hmm. um, the right way to be using that color and in those situations we just make a judgment call on what does that look and feel like yeah. Um, but yes I think it's it's very good points and you know we're always thinking about it and taking it on board and learning yeah. from it I mean I guess, oh, yeah. sorry. it's ahead. also the men with breast cancer because people forget men get it and you don't get male pink products during pink month and actually just keeping an eye on them and making them feel they're not alone and they get breast cancer too and raising that awareness as I well. I mean they there's, there's two points I kind of have here. The first is, yes, exactly on that. I mean, one of the most famous male breast cancer blogs in the US is called Entering a World of Pink, yeah. um, which kind of, whether we accept the connotations around pink being a super feminine color or not, it does perhaps give an insight into how someone who is not a woman might feel coming into the world of breast cancer. Um, but something I found really interesting, kind of on, on what we were saying about it is an identifier, is we've kind of almost taken an irrevocable step now because it is an identifier it would be very difficult to work backwards and change how we identify breast cancer awareness um, to decide that we want to and then even to um, kind of roll that out. So I think it is, I think what we're all saying is, is kind of in agreement and actually right, it's about how you use pink. I think so. Uh, one other thing I think that um, is a real problem is that nobody has the monopoly or the control over the use of pink. So basically any company can come in and use it. Um, I said often with a lot of lack of transparency about where the money is actually going, if, if there is any money associated with it. But um, I think we also need to be really careful about companies that are actually promoting things um, that may be counterproductive. So, for instance, alcohol is potentially a risk factor yeah. for breast cancer. And there are some of the alcoholic companies using, or alcohol producers, using pink um, to promote their alcohol. So I think there's something as well about the link between the charities and the producers and the reputation of the charities. And we've seen in the last few years how easy it is for a, for a charity to damage its reputation. So people can think about Oxfam and sexual harassment and so on. And I think the charities that work with companies using pink do need to be quite careful. I mean, absolutely, because sort of thinking around this issue about how pink is used by companies, there have been companies that have either used pink to profit or to better their public relations that have then been accused of even containing products that are potential carcinogens, so cancer-causing chemicals. So I think there is a real point to be made about clarity. Um, also thinking about the alcohol point, because this is something really interesting. Um, how many of us actually know what a unit of alcohol looks like? or whether a pint is one or two units, or how many units are in a glass of wine. I actually, to be honest, I'll be completely forthcoming, full disclosure, I didn't until I looked it up. Um, there is this kind of issue around actually educating about risk factors, particularly because the stance on alcohol from the government has recently changed um, in terms of, I think, maximum 14 units per week for both men and women, and alcohol point blank, drinking any increases your risk of developing cancer. That's not to say you shouldn't do it, but how do we tackle this issue of information and actually getting that out to people? Because I doubt many uni students know it. You know, I, I ran the medical student bar at Cardiff. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a thing called the Cultural Society where if you drank a pint of everything behind the bar or a half a pint for girls, you got a T-shirt. And there was a minimum of 14 different lagers, ciders, bitters, ales, and I did it every year for that T-shirt. I drank a lot at uni, it's what we did. Um, I think it's the 80-20 rule. And I think everything in moderation is fine, but don't go to excess. And actually, it's, more, it's worse than postmenopausal women because alcohol only goes to fat. And the more fat you have, the more hormones you have. And it's often binge drinking that can do it. I don't want people to live like nuns. I need people to enjoy themselves. And I know teetotalers who've had cancer. So again, it's that risk. It's just a healthy lifestyle. But coming back to the pink thing, we can't change it because it's the Estee Lauder foundation in the states that kind of launched it back when she got breast cancer so it is a global brand of pink it is something we do have to live with mm -hmm. yeah. but alcohol's hard yeah I, th I think alcohol's hard but I, I really like what you've said I think it is about moderation it's not about not engaging at all but and if you've had cancer it's fine to drink because you've had cancer you may as <laughs> well enjoy yourself but it's also coming back to this awareness point it's you know going in and being aware of what it is yeah. that you're doing um, and I think how we get that information out is really important so if you're at a pink week event with alcohol 
We have written leaflets on drinking moderation and what it looks like. Look out for them. One night, nothing for the rest <laughs> of the week. <laughs> I didn't say that. It's being live streamed. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, does anyone want to say anything else about these topics, both kind of breast cancer, pink commodification, or drinking? I think um, just to say as well, I don't know if it'd be interesting to people, but because um, I work in challenge events, um, so 75% of our Ride London team, um, so we've got over 200 cyclists, are male, and so the, you know the good 150 of them are out there in the pink jerseys, um, you know, cycling the streets of London, raising amazing money for life-saving research, and so yes, I agree. For some men, the pink might feel isolating but actually there are a lot of men who also really embrace it yeah. as a colour and um, especially if they're kind of um, riding for their partners very much see it as kind yeah. of um, yeah kind of it's taking really them with them and it's a really positive thing yeah absolutely yeah I mean we've we've got one question here that was previously submitted by the google um, document link which kind of talks about these issues it's how do we attempt to combat the stigma that only women can get breast cancer? Surely this is a major barrier to treating breast cancer in males, particularly within the earlier stages, and is likely to become a growing issue um, with the growing obesity and aging population. So quite a difficult question to tackle. Um, would anyone like to start? I, you know, if I jump in first? Yeah, go for it. Um, so, Buzz, you might need to correct me if I'm wrong. The, the figures I've got, so um, around 55 thousand women and 350 men a year yeah, are diagnosed right. with breast cancer yep. um so we are talking about a smaller population yep. when we look at um men um but just to say um i was just really excited because i was looking to this ahead of this panel um and actually breast cancer now are funding the world's first study in research into male breast cancer Fantastic. and we started that in 2007 and i just thought it was a really positive way to start kick off this topic because actually you know, it is absolutely something we should be looking at, and it should be really important. Um, and yeah, we're really proud to be funding that study. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and through our merger with Breast Cancer Care as well, um, which will be kicking off on the 1st of April, um, they also have specific um, support that is there for yeah. men with um, breast cancer as well. So yes, there is a long way to go, but we are starting and it is getting there. We're taking some really positive steps. Because men are excluded from so many research and clinical trials. Mm. Because there are yep. so few numbers, they can't get the data. But it's like, well, we won't bother, you're a man. And they just feel alone. I mean, 350 is not zero. I may see one or two a year. And actually, Suffolk is quite a high population. And often, it's el the elderly and farmers, whether that's chemicals in the field, because the incidence of male breast cancer is different to women. So Suffolk is quite a high risk, but it's still one or two a year compared to four or 500 women. So it's tiny. And I guess also thinking about screening, because obviously, routine screening I'm not aware. How accessible is that to men if they would like to be screened? No, there is no... The screening is, is purely for women. And it is one of the difficulties about screening that because it's, for instance, around a certain age group and a certain sex... We can't quite hear you. Sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Sorry. That because, for instance, it's around a certain age group and a certain sex, that it tends to give people the impression that there is no risk outside that. Whereas, f for instance, uh, just going slightly off the topic of men and back to women, the risk of breast cancer rises without any kind of falling off throughout your life, life type. So the older you get, the greater your risk. The reason we don't carry on screening right up, um, inviting people regularly right up to their 90s, is because the benefit begins to fall off. Um, partly because older women get less aggressive breast cancers, partly because they're more likely to die of something else. So it's, a, it's that careful picked age range. But it's the same thing if we come back to men. The, imp the impression that is given by the fact that there is no screening for men and very little publicity about male with breast cancer is the impression that's given is there is no risk and actually there is a risk. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. So our last topic is, well, our last official topic, because mm. I have some more questions, is mm. on attitudes towards the intersection between breast cancer and mental health. Mm. So the reason we picked this topic, we think it's quite important, particularly um, currently, mm. is there was a breast cancer care survey released that found some of the following data, and they surveyed women at the end of their treatment, and they found that one quarter of women actually found treatment, the end of treatment, the hardest part of their breast cancer journey. 53% reported struggling with symptoms that were like anxiety at the end of their treatment and 31% depression. And only one in 10 on being discharged from their hospital treatment said that they felt ready to you know, go back out and live their lives. Um, so I'd like to start, if possible, with 
both Liz and Heidi, because obviously you've, you've got personal experience. Did you find that there was sufficient or any at all support for your mental health throughout your journey? Um, well, mine's ongoing. Um, um, because I have incurable breast cancer, I will, and I have from the beginning, so I will never know what the end of treatment feels like. But um, I certainly can understand that there must be a feeling of when you reach the end of a certain part of treatment, and people say, oh, it's all right, you're done and dusted now, off you go home, get on with your life. Well, unfortunately, when you do have cancer, it's always in your mind forever, regardless, because... Um, Every little pain that you get, any ache, you start convincing yourself that it could be something, it could be something coming back. So, but when you're told, um, right, that's it, you can go home now, your sort of your lifeline has been withdrawn to a certain extent. And I, I remember feeling a bit like that after I had my mastectomy. Um, even though I knew I was going to carry on with treatment, I kind of had this feeling of, oh, well, I've been discharged from the, the surgical oncologist now. Uh, that's really weird, that, that lifeline's kind of gone now. Um, and it was just really difficult. And I certainly was never sat down and told in any meeting that I can remember, Here is, here's some mental health help for you, here's a psychologist that you can go and see if you're feeling anxious. Well, bloody hell, who the hell isn't when they've been diagnosed with cancer? It, it almost needs to be something that is part of your treatment. It should be part of it rather than just all the physical things. Um, I think I fell into, again, I like to be a little bit different because I had cancer in pregnancy and a rare cancer and um, I lost my daughter. I didn't fit into a box and I think that was the problem. Nobody knew where to direct me. They didn't, they didn't know where to send me for baby loss counselling or cancer counselling and then so therefore they, they did nothing. So, yeah. I, again, I thought I knew what it would be like because I've been a breast consultant surgeon and I had nine months of chemo and surgery and radiotherapy and you're seen every couple of weeks and then they say, bye, see you in a year and you're alone and your family expect you to carry on and go back to normal because they're desperate to get their lives back but for you, as Heidi said, is this a cough or a cough? And it's really scary being alone and we cover this a lot in the book I wrote, The Complete Guide to Breast Cancer, about anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. That can hit months or years down the line. You're often in denial, you're coping, you're coping and then something will happen that's like, shit, I've had cancer, I could be dead. I didn't realise that anyone with cancer can have 20 free Macmillan counselling sessions through the oncology unit. And my nurse asked me if I wanted them when I had a local recurrence. And there was a three-month waiting list because she was busy. But it was the best thing I had to talk to someone anonymous about all the crazy shit in my head that my husband didn't understand to help me cope. And it just helped me come to terms with what was happening. But as a doctor, I didn't know that was available for my patients. And I didn't know my patients needed it. Now, I, I now know there's great support on breast cancer care, breast cancer now, the Becca app, Macmillan. But I didn't know to look for it. And my doctors didn't tell me to look for it. And that's the same with any cancer and any illness. So I think there's a real point to be made here about actually that service being A, available, and B, being offered to patients on diagnosis or throughout their treatment so that they can actually access it. Um, I think it'd be quite interesting for you, Sean, because obviously you work for breast cancer now, and this is quite a relevant topic for some of the services you provide. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Breast Cancer Now is a charity at the moment, just fund research. Mm -hmm. um, but what's going to be really exciting, so as I mentioned earlier, um, so from the 1st of April, we're going to be coming together with Breast Cancer Care um, to form one charity, so uniting to come together. And um, what that will mean for women is that it's a bit more of a one-stop shop. So, um, you know, we've got a breast cancer charity now, which is dedicated to both looking for a cure and research, but also to supporting women right now who are living with breast cancer. And I think that's one of the most exciting things that I've seen come out of the charity sector um, in recent years. Um, I'd also say, so we also did a report um, yeah. called Living Well, um, which came out in 2017. Um, and actually, um, Breast Cancer Now, um, we really took a lot away from that survey. And so before, our logo, our strap line used to be, um, by 2050, all women um, with breast cancer will live. Or, uh, sorry, everybody with breast cancer will live. And actually, we then added and live well to the end of that strap line because actually it's just as important to support women and men post-diagnosis and post-treatment as it is they, um, when they're going through. And we really take that to heart as a charity. Great. And, Roz, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, just... 
just briefly, I mean, I, I obviously I don't have the personal experience, but working in the field, I mean, one of the things that has happened over the last number of years is everybody has got more and more specialised. So treatment for breast cancer has advanced, you know, and you now have your medical oncologist, your clinical oncologist, your surgeon, your radiologist, your pathologist, whatever. But actually, in all of that, it can be quite difficult for there to be one person who actually thinks about the patient as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I know Macmillan have tried to address this by, by trying to get, as part of the kind of at the end of the patient acute treatment journey, something called the holistic needs assessment, which is supposed to look at spiritual care and um, I, I can't even remember the full list, it's but it is assessment. supposed to look at everything. Um, but unfortunately, I think it kind of drops down the list of priorities, and I'm not sure that it's really being done in a very focused way and leading to a proper care plan. So I think unless you ask people about these, these problems, they won't tell you about it, because most patients are, are being told by their families and friends, you know, that's great, you've got over your cancer, now you, you can kind of be discharged and get on with life. And they feel a bit bad about telling anyone that actually they feel awful. Um, and I think if they aren't specifically asked about it, then it will be, it, it kind of will be covered up. They won't hear about things. But it is, you know, the NHS is very focused on the specialist treatments. And I think this is where really there's a bit of a trick being missed. And you can't measure mental health. It's not an outcome. No. I can say how many recurrences mm. or how many people die after an operation. Mm. I can't tick a box to say yes, only 5% have depression. Yeah. So there's no yes. impotence to put the money You're behind right. it because you can't yeah. benchmark it as a target. Yeah. But it's interesting because right. um, I, I worked with Macmillan and one of the things I found was they are already so overwhelmed. But I mean, I was at Addenbrooke, so I, I can't speak for elsewhere, but there at least. I do not know how they could add this on to another thing to do, which sounds awful, but it's true. So perhaps there is scope for trying to bring it more from the medical side versus the voluntary side um, and hope that in that way we can cover more people. Um, great, okay. So we're going to move on to some more questions, some of which have been thought of by us, some of which have been submitted through the Google Doc form. So the first one, another controversial issue, surprise, surprise, is on the funding of breast cancer drugs. So this came about from thinking about one drug called Cadcilla, which in 2016 was deemed by NICE, which is the body that um, decides whether drugs can be funded on the NHS or not, as being too costly for treatment, um, so funding by the NHS. In response to this, there was a lot of pressure. The parent drug company Roche lowered the price in 2017, after which it was recommended for routine funding on the NHS. Um, but just thinking about this issue, and it is a very difficult one, I'll start saying that, I think it's worth addressing the question of cost effectiveness in terms of drugs because there will be some drugs that give 100,000 women five more years of life, and there will be some drugs that potentially may cure 100 women. How, d how do we think we can address this issue? I mean, there's no clear answer, but what are our thoughts? Um, so I guess just to say up front, so um, Breast Cancer Now um, did launch a Katsila campaign. Um, so we did um, petition um, both the NHS and NICE and um, Roche as well um, to make sure that that a drug was freely available. We felt very strongly about it. Um, 115,000 people did sign that petition. Um, and obviously we were very excited by the outcome, um, which is that it was fully funded. Um, I think... Yes, like it is absolutely a balance and, um, you know, it, it, it's just a, it's a very complicated um, issue and I, I think yeah. um, I wouldn't, I, I'd say personally, probably not my area of expertise. I think, okay. um, you know, overwhelmingly, like the response to that petition is the biggest that we've ever had as a charity, which definitely shows kind of the power behind it and um, the need for it as a drug. Absolutely. Anyone would like to add anything? I think the problem at the moment is there are <coughs> new drugs being developed and it can take 10, 20 years to get a drug to come to the market and go through the tests. And that drug may give an average of women six months of life. And NICE have to decide, is it worth spending £100,000 to give someone like Heidi another six months compared to giving a kid a lung transplant with cerebral palsy? These are very difficult decisions. But one of the problems at the minute with new drugs coming out in trials is that so a friend of mine um, she was diagnosed with recurrent breast cancer eight weeks before this drug was available. And this drug would give her a long length of life. 
but because she'd been started on the treatment available at the time, she couldn't have the new drug because that's the rules that the drug was released under the trials. And a lot of oncologists' hands are tied. There's a drug available, but because of the admin, I can't give it to you. So people are funding for it privately. And I'm actually trying to get a campaign because I think the problem is a lot of people think people like Heidi with stage four cancer are dying and they look like they're in a hospice. You, would, you look at her on the street and wouldn't think she's dying of breast cancer. And it's that negative campaign that we need to say people are healthy and living and active and worth spending money on. And actually forget about the rules of the drugs. Let's just give people what they need. And it's changing that public awareness that people like us are worth spending money on to keep us living for longer. We're not all well, in stage. And it comes Does that back make sense? to what Sean said, to living well. It's yeah. not just about necessarily adding how much, you know, how much time you can add, but the quality of life. Well, I'm personally very grateful for CAD Silo because that's what's currently keeping me alive. Um, I had CAD Silo in 2016 in October. My cancer had spread further into my skin and my blood vessels. And I was told that the two drugs I'd taken previously to that had failed. Um, and there was CAD Silo that would be available to me. Um, and my oncologist told me, you know, it will buy you X amount of time. And, and it was, you know, I'd started on it around the time that your petition came out. And I backed that petition with every fibre in my body, even though I'd already been prescribed it. It wasn't going to be taken away from me, but it wouldn't give another mum or another lady the same chance that I had. A very, very young family. And the thought of having this thing here that could buy me even if it was a few months, not available to me because it was, it was just too expensive, was just not something, you just can't quantify it. It's life, it's whatever, however much time that is, when you're, when you're facing a terminal illness, effectively, for someone to say, well, I'm sorry, it, it's, it's not worth it. It's not, it you, can't, you can't get that in your head when you've got so much life left ahead of you to, to put a cost on that, it's impossible. And I'm hugely grateful to that drug. And, you know, without it, there's a good chance I wouldn't be sat here not, not looking like I'm, you know, dying. I, you know, I certainly don't feel like that. And that is exactly it. And that is, you know, I've had other chemos before that have made me look like absolute shit, like the witches from Roald Dahl. And uh, I, yeah, it's a great look. And um, Cad Sila gives me an amazing um, life I have. I don't look any different. I don't feel any different. And these drugs are amazing. And you know, I know it's hard when there's it's so expensive. But for me, it's it's what's saving me. It's keeping me going. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, there's I think some accountability to be held here by the parent drug companies who actually ultimately set the prices. Um, Ross, is there anything you'd like to add? I have to admit that was the point that was was swilling around in the back of my mind. I know that they spend a lot of money developing these new drugs, but they will also try to put the highest price on them that they think the market will bear. And some of that is based on things like what the American market or other insured markets will bear. And it seems to me we have to get better. I mean, what I think we heard with Cadzilla was a kind of negotiating stance almost. Nice sets, I think it has to set certain limits on how much money can be spent uh, for individual treatments on the NHS. The manufacturer comes in with a price that's over that, and then they have a bargain, and then they end up with something that actually comes in and is affordable for the NHS. Um, there has to be a slightly faster, better way of getting to that, mm. of working with the drug companies. Um, I'm and not quite sure what it is. Create a huge movement yes. like with Cad Sila. It yeah. is patient advocacy yeah. through social media that can change yeah. things overnight. Mm. But it's interesting also that there seems to be this lack of recognition mm. between something like very privately funded healthcare systems mm. and what we have, which is, okay, we have a private system, but fundamentally it's a public system. Mm. And maybe there should be some thinking there as to how can actually drug companies take this, transnational drug companies take this into consideration. Um, I think so. I think as well, we, I'm not sure that we always take every opportunity we have to work with drug companies in the NHS. We have a, you know, we have an amazing amount of data. We have an amazing number of patients. We can help them get their drugs through clinical trials quicker if we work with them. And there should be a win-win there that at the end of the day we get better prices for the NHS. So I don't know to what extent we really exploit that. How do you think, just, I mean, it's completely hypothetical, but how do you think that would look, what would that look like 
in terms of cooperation? Who, who would actually lead to be involved in this? I'm kind of working on it in the background at the moment. Okay. It, I think it's getting government and NICE and Pharma in a room to say, we are all working together to save lives, stop competing against each other, and let's all work together. And that's what we need, a positive campaign to show that stage four terminal cancer, not just breast, any cancer, looks like this. It doesn't look like people dying. And getting everybody to see we're all going towards the same goal here. It's not about money. It's about saving lives. Great. Um, OK, so moving on. We have a couple of questions around genetic testing, which I think are important to cover. And I'm going to sort of amalgamate the two to cover the key issues. The first is, um, what, do, what is the patient perception, the patient perception of the BRCA test um, and other tests for hereditary breast and ovarian cancers, which activities are needed to develop an environment where patients can be um, diagnosed and treated appropriately, especially for these types of hereditary breast cancers? Should I? Yes, it, this is way out of my kind of area of expertise, That's but okay. I will just, just make a couple of observations, if I may. So one of them is I am constantly surprised, in a way, at how many women I see coming in through the breast clinic, not, not through screening I'm talking about, I'm talking about through symptomatic breast clinics, who, when you say to them, has anybody in your family got breast cancer, will reel off a long list of grandmother, mother, aunts, cousins who have had breast cancer or ovarian cancer, which is often a, a closely related cancer and yet have not sought, have not been to their GPs and have not sought high-risk screening, which is available for women who, who reach a certain risk threshold. So I think, I suspect most women in the population are aware about screening for the population and they get an invitation around the time they turn 50 and they know about that. I'm not sure to what extent people are really cited on the fact that if you've got a family history with many, many family members affected, then you really should be going and telling somebody about it and at least having the conversation mm -hmm. with your local family history clinic or genetic centre to say, am I one of those people who ought to have genetic testing? So I think there is a gap in knowledge out there. So we, um, the awareness has greatly increased with what we call the Angelina Jolie effect. Mm. And when she had her bilateral breast mm. surgery, our phones went crazy and we were just flooded with women. Most breast units run family history clinics, and there are really strict, simple criteria. You come and tell me how many women are affected, or men, and if you check boxes, you'll be referred for screening. And that's good and bad. I get a woman saying, well, my great-gran had it at 90. Do I have the gene? And then someone else saying, well, my aunt, my sister, my mum. Rule of thumb, if there's only one relative in your family with breast cancer, and they were over the age of 45, that does not increase your risk. You need two or three relatives, ideally under the age of 50 with breast and ovarian. If people are concerned, they can come and see us and we go down the route of genetic testing. And it can take, if they're positive, up to two years to come to a decision to have surgery to remove your breasts or your ovaries. It's not something we do lightly. Um, but the charities are very good at helping people spread information, aren't they? Yeah, and um, actually I think... so outside of my capacity as breast cancer now, like talking for me personally, I think one of the things I found um, most difficult um, when I went through my breast cancer scare last year was um, I've got parents who were adopted and so I couldn't give a full family history. I wasn't able to say if uh, my grandma or my great grandma, if I had a family history of cancer or breast cancer. Um, and actually, I think we don't talk about that and actually we don't, we, don't, we don't look at or talk about you know children who are adopted or people who've got family members who are adopted and aren't able to give that family history and actually that can sometimes make things a little bit more scary um, because then you have, it kind of opens up those um, questions a lot more when you're not able to answer them and it should be a really easy thing to go and answer that question in doctor's search when you can't. Um, yeah, it does, it just throws a little bit of a spanner in the works. I can imagine, Heidi, is there anything you'd like to add? I didn't really know much about the, the, the BRCA um, gene, and obviously, other, other than the Angelina Jolie effect. And that girl from, what's that band? And Michelle Keating. That one. Steps, <laughs> she? No, the other one, Liberty. <laughs> yeah, Liber yeah, Liberty so X. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I d it was not something that was even on my radar, and I have zero history of any cancer in my family whatsoever, which was what was asked of me when I first rocked up with the rash at the doctor's. Um, and was told that, you know, I had mastitis. And, uh, yeah. yeah, there was no, you know, I, I 
didn't flag up as any risk for anything at all, to be fair. So, um, yeah, it wasn't something that was even even in my mind. And then the next thing I know, I'm knee deep in cancer. So I've never really, never yeah. really given it much thought beyond that, to be honest. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I mean, it's, it's not going to cover anyone, but I think the education aspect around that is important as well. So people to know when they might be at risk or even just ask the question, might I be at risk? Should I go for a test? And then also, I think it comes back to our question around mental health is around genetic counselling. And if you do get, um, you know, you do have the BRCA gene, for example, BRCA1 or BRCA2, um, what sort of support is there available for so people in that situation? A lot of people think it's as simple as having a blood test, but it's not. And it's a bit like the old days of AIDS testing. And yes, it's great if you're negative, but if you're positive, it means a lot. Before women come to have the test, they have to make sure their family history is right, so they have the right number of relatives. They're then sent to a geneticist for a good hour and a half appointment to see a genetic counsellor. Because let's say, I want the test, but my twin sister doesn't. And I have two kids, and she has kids. And I'm positive, it means my sister might be positive, but she doesn't want to know. And when do I tell the kids? And when do you make the decision? It's really, really complex. So you go through about an hour and a half of counselling with geneticists on several occasions before you even have the test. And then once you've had the test, it can take a year of seeing a surgeon and another geneticist and a psychologist and an oncologist to help talk you through what you do with that information. Everybody is recommended to have their ovaries out after the age of 40 because there's no screening test for ovarian cancer. But only a quarter of women decide to have their breasts removed and the rest are happy to have screening. But it takes a good two years to get to the stage where you decide what to do with the results of the information. Absolutely. And uh, that case that you brought up, I think, is quite interesting. Actually, one of the questions that we had reflected this is, what do you do? How do you handle a situation where someone wants to have the test, but one of their relatives basically vetoes because it, would, it might reveal something about their genetic status? How, how do we handle a situation like that? And the genetics... The counsellors help you decide what to do and who to tell. You can decide to have the test. Your, your relatives don't have to. You don't need to tell them. Mm. But they will help you work through family dynamics because not everybody has happy families. And it can be really hard for patients. Mm, I, I can imagine. Um, okay, so moving on to our final question before we start with questions from the audience. This is quite a general one, um, but I think we can all give an opinion on this. Um, do you think breast cancer is still considered a taboo subject to bring up? or even make people aware of, since it affects a private part of the body that isn't generally talked about much? It's not in my world, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, I guess talking from my experience and um, everybody that I know now, since, I had, since you enter the world of cancer, the language around me now is all, you know, everyone talks about cancer all the time, everybody around me all the time, no one's frightened to talk about it. And, and having, when I was first diagnosed, I went looking for a blog that was like a non sciencey kind of account of what having breast cancer in pregnancy is like. And that there wasn't really anything out there that wasn't very sad and depressing, which is understandable given the, uh, the nature. Um, so, you know, I wrote one for myself. And since that, I, you know, a lot of people came forward saying, oh, it's really refreshing to hear people talk about breast cancer in, in that fashion because it's, it, if, if it's for life, is, do you want it to be sad all the time? Well, no, because that's actually really hard work to be depressed constantly. And I think the, the sort of the way we all are now, I certainly feel that we talk about cancer a hell of a lot more I don't remember ever talking about anything like that with my parents when I was younger um, as weird as it sounds my four and six year old know the words cancer and when they see my mum get changed at swimming they think it's really weird that she has two boobs and they laugh at her because it's really abnormal um, <laughs> so I think the way that we're going with things is that I personally feel that I don't ever feel like I can't talk to somebody about it, and I feel that everybody around me is very open. So my personal feeling is that it's not so taboo now. I think it's partly a cultural thing. Mm. So I think that from you know, many people in this country, it's not taboo now. Um, I still see people from some other cultures, immigrant cultures, where it's, it is a really taboo subject. And certainly what I hear about some other countries, 
it's extraordinarily taboo. And indeed, one sees women presenting from there with very late cancers because they don't talk about it and it's shameful to go and get it treated. So I think there is an awful lot of work to do still, although I think we've made massive strides here. Um, so mm. There's a, a great um, a girl with um, lung cancer on Instagram called Curry and Cancer who was diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer in her 20s. And she said, in my Sikh community, nobody gets cancer. I don't know anyone who's ever had cancer. We don't get it. No, they do, but they just don't talk about it. It's not even in their awareness that it can happen to their community. It's yeah, I, I think um, actually um, the cultural strides we have made and um, with breast cancer and cancer in general becoming um, less taboo is, especially in breast cancer, one of the things we've been tackling in fundraising is that breast cancer is not a done deal. I think um, there's a lot of um, feeling out there, you know, that breast cancer is fully funded, that the research is there, that, yeah, you know, and actually it's not. We've still got a long way to go, and um, I think that's really important to remember. So keeping that in mind, kind of leading on from this question, how do we feel about some of the ways in which breast cancer and cancer in general is talked about? Um, I'm sliding into words here like warrior or fighter. How do we feel about that? Because obviously the outcome isn't that everyone wins. So I, I think the You, Me and the Big C podcasts have done fantastic things about raising. Have you all heard of it? So um, three girls with two with metastatic cancer, one with um, stage three cancer, and one was Rachel Bland, the journalist who died last year. And they're in their 30s and they talk about everything. Sex, mental health, exercise. They're doing a lot to raise awareness in the community and death and dying. They had Greg Wise on talking about losing his sister. There's been a huge Macmillan campaign going on at the moment about language. And this didn't affect me before I had cancer. And some people love the battle terminology. But to me, I didn't choose to go into battle. It happened to me. And if I lose the fight, it means I'm a failure. And actually, it's medical science that loses the fight. I fight to stay alive, and I fight to cope with the side effects of all the crappy treatments. But it's not a fight you can win. And, but the media love it. It's all oh, battle and survival, and they lost their journey. You think, oh, for goodness sake. You wouldn't say someone lost their battle with diabetes, or they lost the fight with pneumonia. But it's sexy in the media, and I hate it. <laughs> you must. Yeah, I, wrote a, I did write a blog basically with that, <laughs> those almost exact words in it that I can. As somebody with stage four, I'm, I can't stand people... It's, it, this sounds really terrible. I'm really pleased for people when they're like, I did it, I beat cancer, I'm a survivor. It's really difficult for somebody like me that I'm never going to get to say those words. And this, what does that make me? Am I, I basically am forever a loser because I will always inevitably end up losing my battle with cancer. And I can't stand that in the same way that I can't stand those bells that they have in the chemo unit. They have these bells that people ring at the end of treatment and they're in the oncology ward and they're there for everybody else that's got cancer that will have cancer forever and will always be on treatment and then next to them someone stands above them and goes ding, 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 ding. My treatment's over. Fuck you, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just, it is just, you just, you're so happy for them but you equally think, that is another reminder to me that I will never have that. And that's, yeah, it, just, it really boils my blood about the whole, yeah, the term, she's a fighter, she survived, she beat cancer, she kicked cancer's ass. Okay, so well, I'm, what am I? I'm just somebody who's never going to get to do that. I'll just lose forever, be a loser. 30% of women with breast cancer are going to die because of it. 30% are never going to win that fight. I mean, you didn't exactly choose this, so... No, certainly not. <laughs> um, anything that anyone else would like to add on the language topic? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. We are now going to move from uh, prescribed questions to live questions. Um, so please, anyone, feel free to bring your questions to the panel. It can be to one particular member or anyone, um, and it can be on any of the topics discussed or any of your own topics. Hello. Okay, 
give you a moment to reflect. Well, I'll, I'll start. I, I'm an Apple geek. I love all the gadgets and the computers and all the apps. And I, I naively assumed there'd be all these apps to help me when I was having chemo. And there was nothing. And I discovered on my last day of chemo, there was a Macmillan app that helps you keep track of all the symptoms and all the numbers and, and everything you need to know. And I was treated in a Macmillan center by Macmillan staff who'd never heard of this app. Now, why would they? Because they've never had cancer. I used to tell patients, don't Google because it's scary. I'll tell you what you need. I know everything. It's the first thing I did. And I think we should now signpost patients to all the digital things out there, the apps, the blogs, the websites. This is where you go. This is where you look. This is who you call. There's a charity and a website for everything, and doctors don't know it's out there. It's patients that need to tell us. This is a friendly blog I read, blog, sorry, of a mum who had breast cancer. Go here, they'll help. Rather than struggling to find it for yourself and growing that community. Yeah, and wading through a lot of things that in the end don't prove useful or and actually make you feel worse. You. Absolutely. Um, anyone who'd like to go next? I, I was going to say, um, I think evenings like this, um, for me, so from a charity perspective and fundraising perspective, I think the best thing Breast Cancer Now can do and other charities can do is listen to patients and listen to advocates and come and hear people's stories and, you know, take those learnings away um, and, you know, act on them as well. So for me, that would be the biggest, biggest thing we can keep doing. Um, difficult, really, but um, there's lots of things, I suppose, and then also not, because I feel like I've been treated brilliantly. Um, but I guess I think you just want to be listened to more as an individual, because I remember being really mollycoddled by the woman on the day that I was given the news, the, um, the nurse that was there, and she was just like, you know, you cry as much as you like. You, you know, the tissues are there. You can scream in this room if you want to. And I felt like saying, fuck off. That's not like me at all. And I felt like I'd got across fairly quickly the kind of person that I was. And I felt that she was just treating me like ev every other uh, cancer patient. And a lot of people want that approach. And that's great. But it was the ap absolute opposite of what I wanted. So I feel the care needs to be a bit more individual. Um, but other than that, really, I feel things have been fairly good so far. I mean, I'd definitely like to go back and um, punch my GP in the face for being really patronising to me and telling me that there was nothing wrong with me continuously and he was a right knob about it as well. And um, I feel like I that, that, but that, that's not, he wasn't involved in my cancer care, but he was my first point of contact. And had I not been the stubborn ass that I am, things, well, I don't think I'd be sat here right now with you lovely people, so yeah. I suppose I'm really focused on the scientific side, so screening is my area. Um, I come back to the harms versus benefits. So I'm not sure that there's that much we can do about benefit. It kind of comes with screening. We make screening as good as we can. But I think we can do something about the harms from screening. And for instance, there's a very variable rate. Remember I talked about recall rate and the number of women that will be called back for further tests. Uh, that varies quite a lot in different screening units and we've, we're getting more and more data and evidence about how we can hone that down and reduce the numbers of women that we call back and we biopsy and get better at detecting the cancers that matter. So I'm, that's my main area of focus, trying to reduce the harm. And if I may, just from my own perspective with Pink Week, um, I think trying to get people to know earlier, because although, for example, for women, our greatest risk is postmenopausal, I think it's important to know earlier, if you know what to look out for, if you are that one woman for whom it happens at 20 or 30, um, you know what you're looking for, you won't wait. And actually, a lot of what we've come back to this evening is talking about accurate information and knowing what you're getting into, so knowing um, the risks around screening, knowing the risks around drinking alcohol, and things like this so that you actually can then make informed choices, which may not seem to matter so much now when you're 20, but I think cumulatively do. So my, you wonder who teaches you to examine your breasts or examine your bollocks. My mum didn't, my friends didn't talk about it. I never examined mine because I was never gonna get breast cancer. I'm a breast surgeon. And most of my patients say, well, I'll do it once a year when there's something on the telly or Peggy gets any stenders. <laughs> 
And now there are great apps that will put a reminder in your phone telling you when it's the middle of your cycle, it's time to check your boobs, or first of the month, check your balls. It's talking to our friends and telling our family and you need to do it, it's important. And and there are some amazing resources mm -hmm. out there. I think actually it's one of the things charities and mm -hmm. um, you know blogs and things like that have come so far um, in that in the last couple of years. And I know I mentioned them before, but Copperfield really mm -hmm. do, and they have their festival, and they've got some fantastic ambassadors and breast cancer care as well. Do some amazing work around um, early detection, and we have our um, Touch Look Check campaign. And I think yeah, it's spreading those and um, yeah, rather than sharing the pink hearts, share the. Yeah. Share the signs and share the um, the touch look check and things like that. It's just really important. Because you're absolutely right. Copperfield can actually, if you just text a number, yeah. they will actually text you once a month and yeah. say, yeah. check your breasts. Um, any more questions from anybody? Yes? Yes. Um, yeah, it is, and um, it's kind of what Liz was saying earlier, that because it is a smaller um, amount that we're working with, that research is taking longer. Um, it's not something I've got to hand, but what, if it would be helpful, what I can do is share any updates um, from our research um, with the team here, and um, they can pass those on. Would that be okay? So I think if most breast cancer trials take 12 to 15 years to come to paper, because we look at 10 years survival, so if you get 350 men in the UK diagnosed a year, you need to wait 10 years to see what happens to them, then a year to write the paper. You may need to wait 15 years to get enough men to get enough numbers to say this drug is actually working, and that's the problem. But it does take five or 10 years to prove that this treatment is actually working. Well, no, we can definitely no, we can, I can absolutely yep. look into that, yeah. Sorry, I, just, I don't want to give you um, <laughs> false, false information. No, absolutely. Sure it um, you. But yes, we can liaise through Pink Week for that information. Um, but I, I do think it's probably quite difficult because the numbers, whilst existent, are, are low and for studies that, that can prove a problem. Um, any more questions? Yes, from the back. I guess you've just got to be sort of led by her as an individual, mostly. Um, the best thing to do is to talk, because a lot of people clam up when you've got a diagnosis, and they don't know what to say, and they're worried about saying the wrong thing. And you can just say, I want to help you. I don't know what, what I need to do. And I think that's the main thing, is just to be brutally honest with somebody. Like, I want to do exactly what's right for you, but you're going to have to ha guide me on what that is, because you, we're all in... No, neither of you know what the hell's going on and I certainly felt like that me and my friends were all rabbit in the headlights for the first few months um, I think the main thing is to is just to, to almost to get on with everything as as normal not suddenly start tiptoeing around somebody because actually the day before their diagnosis they they were one person and they've gone in and had this diagnosis but even though they've got this label, they'll still feel physically the same as they did the day before, and people forget that, and they start seeing, like you were saying before, when someone says, oh, somebody's got stage four cancer, they expect you to be a dribbling, spewing mess in a corner somewhere, and actually you're not, and you're still doing all the things that you did before. You haven't suddenly become a, a weak person that needs to be wrapped in cotton wool, and I think that's important to remember, and just see, just be judged by who they are as an individual, and just talk, that's the main thing. I think it's important to remember that if she's finished treatment, she no longer has cancer. She's your stepmom, and she may get cancer in the future. And for me, it's all anybody wanted to talk about. I went to book clubs for a year. How are you? How's the cancer? Oh, what's the gossip? I have a life. And actually remembering I'm a person, cancer doesn't define me. And I would say, whenever you want to talk or you're having a low moment, I'm here to support you. But the rest of the time, I'm not going to bring it up because you're just my stepmom. But when you need me, I'm here. You just need to tell me you want that conversation from me. But everybody is different. And she may handle it very differently to how you would do it. And again, it's just talking, doing the best thing for her. You will make mistakes. There are no rules. <laughs> I think in some ways that's quite similar to a lot of other diseases. Um, great. Any more questions to round up?
yes, I guess, sorry, that's my fault. Um, I don't think the festival is a fundraising <coughs> event. I think it is an awareness event that Copperfield do. So um, apologies, that's that's my fault. Um, but um, what I would say is I would say there's no right or wrong way to fundraise. Um, and if you want to fundraise, amazing. If you don't want to fundraise, that's absolutely fine as well. And for some people... Um, that, that is what they want to do and they want to do a big event. Some people want to climb a mountain, some people want to run a marathon, some people just want to set up a monthly donation because that's right for them. And what we at Breast Cancer now want to do is support people in the way that they want to fundraise or not fundraise or just do some campaigning or you know if it's just signing a petition um you know and that's important to us as a charity. Um so I guess I would never want to impose upon somebody what they should or shouldn't do. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think I, I see what you're saying um, in the sense of, and we were talking about this a bit before we came down mm -hmm. about, you know, is it the right image if you've got a load of students getting hammered all in the name of breast cancer? Well, actually, um, there is that, obviously, the link, <coughs> with, you know, talking about do we want to promote alcohol and, and those kinds of things. I'm caught kind of more of the, um, the sort of persuasion that I think any money raised is good money and it's all for a good cause and I think the way that you guys are doing it here seems to work where you have a week dedicated to lots of different events and you've got evenings like this where you've got the educational and awareness side of it um, and I do think people won't necessarily you know might be having a couple of shots of vodka and not necessarily going to lose sight of the real reason why they're actually there because they're still there and the money is still being raised and yes, I think you're right that money can be raised in, in whichever way um, people kind of want to do it. So me as a, someone with cancer would say that I'm not offended if you want to get hammered and raise money for breast cancer research. That's absolutely fine with me, but I can't speak for everybody. I, people might have a different view, but I think the balance here from what I've seen seems to be, seems to be right. And I'd say the balls are going to happen anyway and people are going to go out and drink and misbehave yeah. and have fun and be students. And I would say have a great fun event and actually make that cancer awareness education free. That's just you're having a ball to raise money mm -hmm. and then do the pink week on the side to come and just kind of separate the two. I think that's what we've really tried to do this year in terms of you are going to have a big fun ball and that is our main fundraising event. And it's great, it does raise a lot of money. But by pairing that hopefully with education and awareness then you're kind of covering all grounds. But as with everything we've discussed, I don't think there is one right answer. I don't think you're going to please everybody. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. It doesn't mean necessarily there's something wrong with us. I think it's just the way of the world and that's okay. Um, would anyone like to say anything just to finish off? No, we're okay. Well, in that case, I just want to thank everyone firstly for coming. Um, I'd really like to thank also Union President Will, who's been amazing in organizing this. Jess, who hasn't been on stage, but has organized this all with me. I think I would have gone mad without her. All of the Pink Week Committee. And finally, a huge thank you to all of you for coming all this way to talk about this. Um, it's been a really great discussion. Thank you, everyone, for coming.